This is the Sales Gravy Podcast. I'm Jeb Blunt, best-selling author of Fanatical Prospecting and Sales EQ, and I'm here to help you open more doors, close bigger deals, and rock your commission check. On this episode, we continue with part two of my multi-part interview with Patrick Tinney, the author of Unlocking Yes and a Negotiation Strategist. In part two of our interview, we're going to take a deeper dive into negotiation strategies. But before we get started, let's talk about a cousin to negotiations, and that is sales objections. And I know you get them because I know you're in sales, and everybody who asks for anything is going to hear no at some point. I have just released a brand new book called Objections, The Ultimate Guide to Mastering the Art and Science of Getting Past No. And I couldn't be more excited about this book because it teaches you the frameworks that you need to get past no, along with the the techniques that you need to become rejection proof and the influence frameworks that you need to reduce resistance from your prospects and customers in the first place. You can pick up Objections right now at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or wherever books are sold. So go pick up Objections. I guarantee you that this is one book that will help you make more money this year. And now here's part two of my interview with Patrick Tinney on sales negotiation strategies. One of the things I see about negotiating is we always give these examples of these really, really big deals. Like, for example, I mean, I, the example I use all the time is I'm, I was negotiating a big deal with a Japanese firm. And there were, I don't know, 10 people in the room and the negotiation lasted, you know, a month and a half. And there was all of the, the, you know, the, the, the pomp and circumstance and the ritual of going through it. And the guy I was negotiating would never even talk I mean, he was sitting on one side of the room and I learned early on that I needed an interpreter because I was getting, you know, the best taken out of me. We talk about those things like these, these epic deals that we negotiate, but I salespeople are negotiating every day, like little things like the time that they're going to be able to walk through a plant and who's going to be walking through with them and the stakeholders that are going to get involved and, and, and small things like, you know, we get hung up in price, but you know, the terms and conditions. And in fact, I see people negotiating price, but they give away everything else in the process as well. So, so I see to, to me, um, what I see is is salespeople constantly caught up in the emotions of negotiating both big and small things. And the reality is that if I go back to what you said earlier is a discovery, if I've gone through the entire sales process and I'm at the point where I'm closing, typically what's happened is the prospect has made a decision for me. Like they've made a decision to do business with me. If I've done my job, I shouldn't be negotiating anything until the prospect has decided that they want to do business with me. And I see salespeople negotiating before that fact. So they're having a conversation about whether the person's going to pay this price or not, but the person has not made a commitment to a timeline, to delivery, to um, that person being a vendor of choice or that company being a vendor of choice. So they, in, in essence, are negotiating with themselves. And the, the position that I, I want to be in, in fact, I'm, and, and, and I do get myself in those positions. I lose negotiations when I'm negotiating myself. I almost never lose a negotiation when the person says, I really want to do business with you, but like, that's the point where I can work that out. I can, I can work out a solution. And we both have to make a decision at that point, how bad we want the deal. Does the, does the prospect, do they have enough reasons to do business with me if I create enough value so they're willing to give up something in order to get my organization or and 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 this is you know happens to me all the time I've made a decision that like you said there's so much upside to this particular piece of business in terms of getting in the door and building out a relationship that I'm willing to give up something on my side for the opportunity for the long term and you're making those decisions you know all the way through so whether it's cheesecake or whether it's, you know, negotiating who's going to be sitting at the table in a room or are you going to be able to get your hands on your competitor's invoices or their proposal or what have you, that's what I see salespeople engaged in all the time. And, and they're afraid. I mean, they're like, how do I get that? I'm afraid to ask. Why, am I, why are you afraid to ask? Why are you afraid to just 
reach out and get that because once if you, you're either going to get a yes, no, or you're going to get a maybe, and the maybe is what you negotiate. You know, that's that's I, I'm 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 interested in like the think that the from really at the at the at the mechanical level of the everyday process that salespeople go yeah. through. What's holding them back? What do, what are the techniques and things that they need to do? Because I, I think that the audience, I think if we think about most of us, most of them are not negotiating, you know, hundred million dollar deals. Most of them are negotiating five thousand dollar pick up a piece of equipment, or I mean, I, we negotiated a you know a twelve hundred dollar software purchase, software as a service purchase for a team, you know, last month, and, and negotiation lasted for three days. Yeah, yeah. Let me guess, you got emotional about it. Well, I wasn't emotional at all. I didn't. I could. I didn't care. No, but if it goes on for, if it goes on for three days, I mean, you know, just think about how much time was used up. It was. It, it was. It, it was. But the long term impact of buying a subscription for an entire team, like over time, that that adds up. In, and and I was emotional in that I wanted to get the best deal for myself. And there was a crack when I asked for a better price. They said, "Okay, let's talk about it." So I made a decision to do business with them. I wanted to do business with them. They wanted my business. And I mean, you know, and it was the end, it was the end of, a, you know, a buying period. So people clearly had numbers to make. So that's, you know, that's the, that's the place where I see salespeople everywhere, including my own and including me. That's where we begin to make either great decisions or bad decisions. And these, these strategies and tactics start paying off for us, um, you know, and I'm interested in, in like, how do we teach salespeople in the moment to be better negotiators with the caveat that what you said is exactly right. Discovery is everything. You skip discovery, you skip steps in the process. You're not negotiating, you're haggling and you're usually going to lose. There you go. There you go. You just said it. You know, uh, I didn't mean your point, by the way. It should have been a thumb. <laughs> I got excited. Um, you know what? The, most people don't understand the difference between haggling and negotiating. Haggling is what happens in schoolyards. Um, there are also some cultures where, um, uh, where forms of haggling are, are respected, expected, and um, they're cultural. Uh, you know, a lot of the open markets that you see uh, around the world. I mean, this, this is the, it's, an, it's an art form over there, but it's usually on smaller cost items. So um, I want you to know, I want the audience to know, everything in negotiation is scalable. So remember I got talking about our families earlier, and you got talking about your cheesecake. That's a family issue. That's a personal issue with a family. And you're trying to sort of say to that person, you know, uh, you know, uh, that cheesecake means so much to me. How much does it mean to you? Sort of thing. <laughs> anyway, we, we won't get too deeply in that, but it's to say that you, you have to understand um, a few things. You have to understand what competitive sets there are around the industry that you're, that you're dealing with. You have to understand. One of the things I go through in the book is a SWOT analysis. I, go, I, I, uh, I ring fed a SWOT analysis. We SWOT ourselves, which is very difficult to do because it's really difficult and sometimes embarrassing to sort of say, here are our weaknesses. You talk about, um, in your book, EQ, murder boarding. And I just, I, I loved it. I, th I just thought, oh man, he's taking business implications and he's just pounding the heck out of it. But that's what makes you great in a negotiation. Because what you, the next thing you do is you go look at your competitor and you will look at all of their key leverage points and say, these are the things that they're going to use as the strength if, I'm, uh, if I've got a competitor in the negotiation, which happens all the time. And um, I have to understand their key leverage points. I also have to understand their weaknesses because I, I, you know, I, I may at some point have to insert one of those. I don't do it um, uh, with any malice. It's just, it's just part of business. It's just like we deliver better than they deliver on this. And by the way, that's empirical. I can proof it up, right? Period. When I first wrote the programs around Unlocking Yes, uh, I thought back to myself, I said, right, so what's really important about negotiation? Well, number one is that you want to remove as much negative risk as you can. So if you know that there are issues that customers have around risk, you want to remove those. Um, the next thing is, is you want to raise positive risk. So you want to make sure that when you go into the negotiation, you don't come out with less than when you went in with. 
and you want to stretch yourself, you want to stretch your company, you want to stretch the customer. Um, the, the third part is, is there will be this back and forth. Now, you, you sort of talked about it as being those icky little parts. I just sort of look at it as, as, as very direct conversation pieces. Uh, culturally, uh, just before I finish this, uh, you talked about uh, being in Japan and there being a lot of, uh, of ceremony. The very earliest uh, book on strategy uh, was written in the Far East, um, and it was written by a Chinese general. It's called um, The Art of War. And it's, it, it, this book is like almost like, I don't know, so over a thousand years old. But most of the um, negotiation culture from uh, the Far East is built on pieces of that book. Now, in, in, in uh, Japan, it will be slightly different than it would be in China. Uh, uh, China, uh, if you read any of Tony Fang's work, and I recommend friends that you do, so he wrote a book on uh, negotiation uh, uh, Chinese style, and, and it's a brilliant book because uh, he talks about how culture, uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the three pieces of philosophy that they have in, in, in China really set up a base for negotiation. And India is even more different from, from that. The United States uh, is, is a very um, 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 clearly spoken, we understand uh, what we want, we get it up on the table early. And by the way, we've also inserted things called procurement departments. Now procurement departments are not the same as buyers. Procurement people are, in many cases, uh, they're accounting people, uh, they are people that are statistic uh, database people, and all they do is focus on the price and taking the price and, as the Chinese would say, squeezing the water out of it, and, uh, and they want to get it down to nothing. I was talking to a colleague yesterday that sells software, and, he, and I don't think he sat in front of too many procurement people, and he had another uh, big deal coming up. And I said, you have, to ha you have to understand how they buy in that scenario. You have to understand how they buy, not how we sell. Yet when you're when you're dealing with a company whose culture is built on austere uh, on being quite austere, uh, being modest, and or you're uh, dealing with a company whose whose idea is to be disruptive in in, in the space, then it, those negotiations become uh, very um, they, they grind, they grind, and and you have to rely on your cost modeling and your intelligence and building value. And by the way taking the risk out of the deal because one of the worst things that can ever happen to any of us is that we sign a deal that we don't like and then we have buyer's remorse and I will tell you that if you sign a deal that you don't like it will leak on uh, implementation. I'm the on the street sales guy mm -hmm. and the on the street sales guy is not reading the, the, the art of war, not looking at procurement people, not looking at that stuff. The guy on the street is trying to sell a truck Right. Or we're trying to sell a software program in the moment to a buyer. So when we talk about taking risk out of the deal, let's let's talk about what that really is. Like, what does that really mean to the individual salesperson? Because I get, you know, I get there's a group of business people negotiating some large deal, but most of us are not. Most of us are, right. are negotiating something that's it's a low cost, right? Overall low risk to the business, although there, there is a high risk to the individual buying it. And dealing with purchasing and, you know, those groups, if you if you're stuck in purchasing, the problem is you created that problem. I mean, you got stuck in purchasing. That's how you ended up there. So for me, it's I always start at before I get to purchasing, if, if purchasing is my only way to buy something, I'm haggling. I promise you I'm haggling because the purchasing department is going to look at the price. And that's what they're going to deal with because they don't care about the employment, impl the implications. So if I don't have a sponsor in the organization, if I don't have someone who I'm selling to, for example, I, if I want um, if I want to sell sales training, for example, I go to PL owners. I don't go to people who don't have a PL. I'm I i do not want to sell to the head of sales. I don't want to sell to HR. I want to sell to the person who runs the division. Why? Because the person that runs the division's got juice. Now, am I going to have to negotiate with the people that are in HR and the people that are that are in you know in the sales organization? Absolutely, those folks are going to negotiate with me, but I've got leverage because the guy who has or the woman who has the the money is is where I started, 
And so I understand why they're bringing me in, why would they would spend the money, why they would do these things. So as I begin negotiating terms and conditions with these other folks who don't have money, I'm able to use that person to block stupid things that are going to take away from my ability to sign a deal that I'm not going to resent. Because that's, that's, you're exactly right. I don't want people to resent the deal. And another example for taking risk out, you know, early on in the process, if we look at, you know, software implementation, any kind of business service implementation, the highest risk to the company is that you disrupt their operations while you implement the program. Like that's their biggest problem. But salespeople don't focus on that. What salespeople are focusing on is, is the price. So they get the price first rather than de-risking the process by creating a, a set of implementation dates and timelines that they get people to agree to upfront before they're negotiating. So I'm negotiating whether or not we will start implementing your program on this date or this date, not how much will it cost for us to do that. And I think that's one of the things that I see is that we're negotiating a lot of times the wrong thing. We're negotiating with ourselves. We're negotiating in a vacuum. And, and I, I want to dial into specific things that right. individual salespeople can do yes. using the techniques in your book to become net better negotiators. I, I mean, I, I, love, I love talking about the epic. I love talking about the strategy and the, you know, and the, you know, the philosophy. But the reality is, is that you know, right now somebody's listening to us and they got to go out and hit the street and they're going to be in front of a buyer in about three hours. And they're going to know what to do. And they're, and they're negotiating a thousand dollar add on charge to do, you know, to do a delivery versus the customer picking it up. I mean, you know, stuff like that. Make sense? Yeah, no, perfect. It, it does. The only reason I brought procurement into it is, is that increasingly that's what's coming into play in, in the marketplace across a lot of streams. And I, 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 I'm just bringing that in. Let well, me- well to, t- to some extent, I mean, we, we procurement did. I mean, if we go back and look at, say, 15 years ago, mm-hmm. we had a major problem with procurement, and that was the reverse auctions. So the reverse auctions began to come into to play mm-hmm. big time. Yeah. And, and, and they're pernicious. And you don't, they, they, but they've, they, you can see that the reverse auctions have, that they've run their course. And I'll give you an example. I worked for a company. I was the VP of sales for this company, and we made a decision culturally that we would not engage in a reverse auction. And we went to customers who would call us in and say, we have a reverse auction. And we said, we're not playing. And a few of them told us to go pound sand, but a bunch of us brought, a bunch of them brought us in and we were able to change the terms because they needed us. We had, you know, we had leverage, we had prices, we had information, we had things that we could do. And and that is brand alignment. Okay. That's well, well, that's a, that's a big word, Patrick, and I'm, I'm going to challenge you on that. So let's don't call it brand alignment. That's called, I'm not going to play your stupid game. So, I mean, we're talking about leverage here, right? So, for example, when the customer says, hey, this is how you play the game, we go, we're not playing that game. It's the same thing if you get an, a blind RFP. I'm not, I'm not sending in your blind RFP. Yeah. So if you, if you say, I'm not going to do those things, you're negotiating the terms of engagement at the very beginning. Like you begin shaping the end negotiation there. Is that- and so, and, and so um, to answer your, your questions and, and, and I'm, you- I'm just, I'm just going to be the guy who, I'm, 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 I want to keep it real. I, I don't want to use, big words. I don't want to use big strategy. We got, we got somebody right now that's counting on you to yeah. teach them what they need to do to go out and make a better deal. Thank you so much for joining me on part two of my conversation with Patrick Tenney, the author of Unlocking Yes on Sales Negotiation Strategies. In the next episode, we're going to take a deeper dive into tactics that you can use as a sales professional to become a better negotiator. Now, I want you to go and pick up my brand new book, Objections. You can get it at Barnes & Noble or at Amazon or wherever books are sold. But go get the book. It will make you more money this year, I guarantee. The book is Objections, the ultimate guide to mastering the art and science of getting past no.